Good afternoon and welcome. Buenas tardes. Welcome to uh, Via Voices. I'm John Fanestel, Executive Director here at Via International. And on behalf of the entire team, we welcome you and thanks for joining us. Today, we'll be talking about Via's work in global edu education, uh, which is a continuation of a conversation we started last week. Last week's subject was uh, Via's work in community development. And as with last week, we'll be hearing a little bit of history and the evolution of this program. And we'll uh, be doing, uh, hearing that history from our friends, uh, Elisa Sabatini and Rigo Reyes. So I'm gonna uh, bring them into the spotlight. Uh, welcome, uh, Rigo, bienvenido. And welcome, Elisa. Rigo Berta Reyes, the Senior Program Director here at VIA International and Elisa Sabatini, our President and CEO. Uh, today's conversation is gonna be led by uh, Jim Gerber. Jim uh, is a retired professor from San Diego State, known to many of you and is the newest member of our VIA board. We're so pleased to have him a part of the team and I'm gonna bring him in and uh, Jim, I'll, I'll turn it over to you, welcome. Thank you, John, and uh, good afternoon, everybody. It's uh, a pleasure to be able to uh, sort of try to guide the conversation. Uh, and I'm hopeful that Rigo and Elisa will chime in as, as it seems appropriate. Um, as John mentioned, this week's uh, topic is about global education. And last week we talked about community development, which is, it seems, is where uh, VIA began. But at some point, global education became a significant part of, of, of VIA. And I'm wondering, Rigo and Elisa, if you could, if you could uh, tell us a little bit of the history of that. How did global education uh, attach itself or become part of the mission of, of VIA? I guess I, I could start. I could start by at least giving you my experience, uh, having been with this organization for going almost on 37 years, and this particular component, uh, although it wasn't known at that time as as global education, it was more known as kind of like a mission type of a, a, a programs or activities, and primarily a lot of the groups that were coming to the border were mostly religious or church affiliated uh, groups. So a lot of the work that was being done at that particular time was more bringing assistance to various different communities. I wanna stress the fact that I wasn't that much involved at that particular time. My focus primarily when I came into our organization was more focused on the community development aspect of the organization. So the organization was actually working within two different components or two different departments. Whereas one department was focusing more on the development of communities, whereas the other ones was more focusing on the mission aspect of it or uh, the approach of, of, of uh, working more directly with uh, approaches of, of, of just helping out the community in general in a very short term way. Whereas my focus was more directed and more in the long term way. In any case, uh, the, the organization for many years worked in that manner. And um, as, as it evolved and developed, we started uh, contacting, we started getting more uh, relationship with different uh, educational institutions, high schools specifically, and then later on it went to universities. So uh, the whole aspect of it as it grew, uh, I want, at one time, uh, there were so many groups that were wanted to come to the border basically and have this particular experience where we have a pretty large waiting list, if you will, of, of groups, actually groups that wanted to come and the capacity that we had was limited in a sense because we could only we could only host so many so many so many groups at a time. Uh, I think Elisa came in uh, do, uh, during that time, 1999, I believe, or 2000, where we started shifting somewhat the uh, the focus of the uh, of the experience. And uh, I'll let Elisa maybe talk a little bit more about that as far as as far as uh, her involvement and also how it evolved the involvement of the whole global education aspect of it. Yeah, I think back um, when I came on board, there was, yes, more of a mission approach. And as Rigo mentioned, a very separate program between the things that the promotoras and the community people were doing, and then these groups that came. Um, at that time, our work was really focused on infrastructure at schools. So the work of the groups was often, they'd call it the cement program because these student groups would come and work from nine to five and lay cement at the school so the kids could have a soccer 
field or, you know, something um, a little more, uh, uh, if you will, dignified at their, at their school uh, locations. And um, at that time, we hosted about 50 groups a year. In fact, we had a group every week. And some of the schools would fight over the weeks. They would be like, no, I want the third week of June. And no, I want the And so we'd have to like stack them up and sort of figure out how we would, would uh, support all these groups. Um, the other thing to sort of say about that era is that the work started, as Rigo mentioned, shifting. Because we also saw the leadership in the women in the communities, the promotoras, the outreach workers as having been well developed. And they were much more um, acknowledged to us as leaders in the community. So when we started going to the schools, we started going to the schools where the promotoras were doing nutrition classes. And, and then the students could not just work on cement for the morning, but maybe in the afternoon, they participated in a nutrition class or learned about microcredit or learned about aspects of the border um, from, if you will, experts in the community. And so the program became more oriented, maybe 50-50 on education than solely on these work projects in the communities. Um, I think that uh, the introduction to young people of um, what's possible in community, uh, especially that kind of shift of thinking, oh, we're gonna go help these poor people to this idea that, oh, these communities are really vibrant and there are leaders in these communities and there are wonderful people in these communities. And I know at, at one point, uh, a kind of usual quote in the community was, these people are poor, but they're happy. These people might not have the resources we do, but they have things we don't have. You know, the strong community connections and, you know, other aspects of, of, of communities that have to bind together to address the issues that they confront. So I, at that point, I guess I started really seeing the impact of these, these programs. And then I also thought at that moment that we were relatively unorganized in the way we did them. Um, Lisa, then, before, before you jump into the organizing, I'm curious to know this. I'm very familiar, as you can imagine, with this very traditional old school method mindset of Christian mission and mission trips. And as you say, going to help uh, you know, the poor uh, and expecting a kind of a hands-on project. That's such a tr long-standing traditional mo model. I'm curious to know, as, as, as VIA evolved and shifted away from that, did some churches drift away? Because some churches, that's really what they were after? Did it, did it, or did you find it, uh, maybe you lost some and added others? Or how did that work uh, did, in terms of uh, faith-based groups? I'm curious to know what the reaction of churches was. I'm thinking that maybe, Rigo, if you could address that, because there were maybe more churches in the early earlier days then? Yes, de de definitely. And your source spot on as far as your comment, as, as, as far as the expectations and also the traditional way of, of, uh, of uh, particular mission groups and particular church groups working in community. And I myself had a number of encounters with the various different groups at that particular time when I was trying to create to some extent some consciousness as far as sometimes some of the damage that was being caused by, by, by this approach. And of course, some that were very open to, to, to listen. And there was uh, others that, uh, that, that weren't, they were very close to, and they had their own quote unquote agenda, yeah. if you will. And, and that particular agenda could vary from anything from a uh, conversion to, to feeling good about themselves and, and, yeah. and, and patting themselves on the back and saying how good things they were doing. I mean, all those are very legitimate. I think very legitimate feelings, if you will. But to get them to to the point of respect, if you will, for women in the community, and the approach of working with community as a as a give and take approach, because regardless of whatever, a lot of the fo folks that are coming to the border were actually learning and taking something from the community. Yeah. But at the same time, they were also 
leaving some stuff in the community. So being very clear as far as that particular aspect or that particular relationship was is of great importance mm -hmm. and, and being conscious of it. So anyway, yes, uh, uh, there was some churches that uh, some groups ch uh, that uh, uh, decided to start coming on their own, if you will, rather than, than coming through us. But at the same time, there was other groups, particularly more uh, university groups that were really attracted to, to this whole community development approach of working with community. Again, I can't stress enough the, the point of, of a give and take relationship. I, I wanna come back to th these points because I think these are really critical, but I wonder if uh, just for the sake of the audience and for my sake as well, if, if um, could, could you, do, what do you mean by global education? Can you give a, a, a definition of that? And some people have used this term voluntourism as, a, as an equivalency. And I, I wonder, do you see those as the same thing? I wonder if we can just sort of kind of define in a broad way what, what the idea of global education is. I think it's a great, only I could go on for very long about this, but <laughs> I think starting with what John mentioned, mission trips, I think there's a spectrum in this. And um, actually we have some, quite wonderful analysis work that was done by uh, David Clemens, who uh, sort of aligns, shows this spectrum of work uh, across, you know, community uh, to the point of real community development. And I think that um, a lot of it has to do with who are the leaders. You know, I think that there are a lot of groups, the border is, is a right Excuse me, Elisa, when you, when you say leaders, do you mean leaders of the groups or leaders in the community? Actually, actually, being specific there, both, but okay. yeah. the leaders in the communities are really critical to this because that more assistential or we say charitable approach where people go down, perhaps the relationships in the community are not really even that formalized and they just build a house and not to say that that doesn't require a lot of organization and certainly purchase materials, et cetera, but sometimes they don't know where they're building it. They give it to the family and three weeks later, the family sells it. Cause I mean, there wasn't really a clear understanding of the community to do that work. Yeah. And so the more and the closer involvement that you have of the communities themselves, I think is where where you know Villa and Los Niños had really developed these relationships over decades of experience to say, oh, we're listening to this community outreach worker. She's saying this school really doesn't need a soccer court as much as the school over here that needs a new classroom because they have 500 kids in a school that was built for 200, you know? So, the kinds of things where that community voice becomes the determiner of what you're doing in the community is so, so important. And then the leadership on the sides of the schools is also key and important. I, 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 I would like to just mention that we have some partnerships that go for decades, a particular partnership that we enjoy and have for many years is the Kate School. Um, who have come now consistently to our Me Me uh, Mexicali program for many, many years have established deep relationships with our community members there. Villanova that has come to the border region and come to our other locations um, consistently for years. And they actually believe in that aspect of the mission of doing this, this kind of work of developing these relationships in the community. And to, return to your point, I think that at one moment when we were formalizing these programs or trying to formalize them a little more into more of a social business for the organization, for a social enterprise that could bring resources into the organization as well as create this consciousness for young people and do good community work, um, we were looking at ways of presenting it and at that time, back in the early 2000s, this term voluntourism was new and, and, and attractive, attractive to tour groups, to travel agencies, to, and 
over the course of the next few years, if you will, the acceptance or interest in that term um, shifted. It had some um, sort of negative connotations in the world of tourism. And we also, I think, acknowledge that what we were doing was less about solely volunteering, but also about the educational component. And as far as why we're calling it or terming it global education now instead of volunteer travel is partly because now we're not traveling. <laughs> yeah, so, right. so yeah, we'll, we'll get to that. Yeah, yeah. We're, we're really um, emphasizing the, the education and the consciousness component of the, of the work. With uh, Andrea Rocha, our friend has dropped into the chat room the question about global, does that imply that there are groups outside of the United States or are most of the groups hosted by via US based or is there a, is there a global dimension as it's evolved over time? I guess I would, speak to that one as well. Um, in 20, in 2008, when we had the dual ASP or the triple maybe aspects of, of the uh, economic crisis and the cartel crisis in Tijuana and the swine flu all at, all at once in the border region, uh, we, immediately realized with the cancellation of groups and everything that was kind of going on chaotically in that context at that time, that we had to shift pretty quickly to do something else to retain our, our programming. So we, we did move many of the trips that we had from Tijuana to, Me to, um, to Mexicali. And at the same time, acknowledged relationships that we had in other parts of the world. I, my former work was, was in um, more south, all over Mexico, but particularly central Mexico and Guatemala. So we made those relationships, partnerships for the global education that we now do. We have strong partners in central Mexico, uh, in Guanajuato, Mexico, in uh, the highlands in Guatemala, and then also in uh, Costa Rica where, um, where we're doing more ag related to the sustainable ag programs in Costa Rica. And then as well, other partnerships develop really from relationships. Um, we have a signature program in Sri Lanka. So, so those are our current locations. We've also not established ongoing partnerships, but we've had trips to Bolivia and then we did for a number of years, uh, programs in uh, New Mexico and in Appalachia. So um, just getting back to some comments earlier, um, who, who do you see as a target audience for the education part of global education? I mean, the, in other words, is who's, who's uh, who receives the benefits of the education? I mean, who's, who is being educated and how? And related to that, when, when you have a project, you know, what do you expect to happen there? I mean, what do you wanna see happen? How do you wanna see that unfold and, and, and generate um, you know, benefits and reasons for the project? I, th I think, Rigo, if you would talk about the, the students in the border region. Yes. Uh... Our primarily focus has been the education component. And like I stressed before, the whole give and take aspect of it. And as it pertains to now, and particularly what uh, Lisa mentioned earlier, as far as uh, the quote unquote violence that, that, that is pretty much uh, uh, plastered all over the media, uh, obviously had a big impact as far as for us as an organization, uh, hosting hosting groups across the border. So I see from my experience, and, and that's been primarily my focus the last probably eight years or so, has been primarily here in this side of the border, but also exposing them to the realities of border and what border people are. One thing that I stress to the visiting groups, and which uh, the great majority of them are, are universities uh, from all over the country, uh, is that I kind of, see it as I'm opening my world to them. Opening my world in a sense, because again, the only thing that they know about the border is what they have read or what media or social media has, has told them. 
and for us to expose them to the reality of the people that are living here day in and day out, it's, it's an eye-opening experience. Mm -hmm. And for, for what I'm trying to accomplish with this, and maybe I'm selfish in this particular aspect, is I'm trying to educate them as far as to our realities and our issues that we're confronting here. Uh, immigration is, is a topic that is very uh, hot right now, if you will. But in our communities, it's nothing new. We've been dealing with these issues for generations and generations, mm -hmm. yet people are not aware of it. They don't know this. So when, but what I say at them, as far as opening my world to them, I do open my world, my connections, my relationships with different activists here at the border. And what I try to gain from it, and this is why I say I'm, I'm maybe somewhat selfish, is I'm trying to be very realistic. Realistic in a sense, because a lot of the visitors that are coming, a lot of the university students that are coming to learn here at the border are the future leaders of this country. Not that nobody, nobody from my community could, could, could reach those, 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 those goals, if you will. But the reality is that our resources in our communities are very, very limited. Whereas these kids that are coming to visit here and learn about us, they come from more upper scales their, their, their families or whatever are very well connected politically and, and, and whatever else not. So what I'm trying to uh, uh, teach them is basically our reality and hopefully at the time when they do come to power, if you will, they remember what they saw here. They remember what they have learned here. And that's, that's my approach. And that's frankly, that's my motivation. Rigo, we had a quick chat. Uh, somebody new, uh, Dennis uh, Brown, new to VA International, just asked, is there, could you walk quick, real quickly through what would be a typical global education program? What would one experience look like for participants? Sure. And this is based on a week experience and a, and a seven day experience. We oriented them as far as community development, the different approaches of community development here in San Diego and across the border. We also focus quite a bit on the, on the issue of immigration. And, and, and having learned about, about the, the reality of the border, we take them to the border wall. Uh, they, they speak with different people that have experienced this, people that, that uh, are dealing with the issue on both sides of the border. And, uh, and pretty much opening those doors, opening the, those, the, 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 the consciousness and them learning from the people that are living day in and day out this reality. So, so in a nutshell, that's kind of like, you know, uh, uh, the experience that they have, we introduce them to Chicano Park, which is part of our border reality. We, we also introduce them to the, to the indigenous populations here, the Kumeyaay specifically. Few people know that the Kumeyaay are from both sides of the border. They got Kumeyaay here in San Diego, they got Kumeyaay in Tecate and Ensenada and some of those areas. So we also uh, orient them and also expose them to that to realities. And so some groups might cross the border, some groups might spend more time in one location or another, some groups might move from location to location, that kind of varies from group to group, is that correct? Correct, correct, yeah. And, and a lot of it depends on the policies from within the institutions. Uh, some universities will let them cross the border, some others won't. Uh, uh, so depending on that, and, 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 and we depend on, on, on their feedback and what they're telling us, and we, we uh, Kind of like uh, a cater to 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 those to those uh, to 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 those needs, if you will. And then to Jim's question about the outcomes and the takeaways, what's a what what's a successful what is it at the end of it all? How does things wrap up, and what's a successful trip look like, or what's happened at the end of a successful experience of of global education? It's it's the feedback that we get the the. Uh, the openness of, of the people when they get here. And, and for me, it's, it's one of the challenges that I have when I work with the groups because uh, I have no idea whether by the time they get here, do the group know each other? They might be from the same university, but maybe they don't even know each other. So mm -hmm. basically one of my goals is basically to create community within them, to create a community within them and also to see what they can realistically do back home. You know, many, many people want to come because uh, they want to turn around and save the world, if you will. And I try to, I try to bring them down to earth as far as saying, you know what, you have to be very, very realistic as far as how much you can do and how you do it, how you do it, you know. And, and one of the things that I like to stress is that very few people that have the mentality of want to come and help 
they very seldom do they ask the people that are trying to help what are the actual needs, what are the actual issues. Mm -hmm. You see it through your own eyes. You see it through your own needs, if you will. I said it earlier, a lot of times we just want to pat ourselves on the back and without really taking notice or being sensitive to the actual needs of the community. Because in your eyes, maybe, oh, poor people, they don't have food, oh, poor people, they don't have water, oh, poor people, they don't have uh, electricity. I'm going to be the saver. I'm going to come in and save the world or save, save, save the time, if you will, and, and never ask the people there, the people that are living day in, day out, what are your priorities? Oh. It, it, so it, I don't want to put words in your mouth, but it sounds like one of the goals then is that the, is that the people that participate, that is the, the visitors to these sites, uh, gain respect and understanding and acknowledge that although not everybody is as fortunate as they are, nevertheless, they have their own uh, communities, their own ways of dealing with issues, their own intelligence and capabilities for handling the the things that they um, that they encounter. Exactly. So I, yeah, it, 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 go ahead, Elisa. Yeah. Well, I just like to give one other example because it's it's a different one, and I think it touches on some other things that we aspire to do with these trips. Um, a year ago, June, I took with our board chair Phil Hadley. We took a group of teachers. It's a group of about fifty to central Mexico. And these are teachers that are from all over the state of North Carolina. And they um, specifically were on this trip to be able to, to create awareness about the Mexican culture because they have so many Mexican students in their classes. And the way they describe it, you know, a rural area of Georgia that was traditionally maybe majority white and then some percentage black, all of a sudden has these new students in their classrooms that even speak a different language. And the idea of this program was to help the consciousness and awareness of these teachers to be better teachers with the populations that they're now serving. So we took them to Mexico City. And I guess what was part of the, of the, the impact was the cultural appreciation for Mexico the wonderful history, the visits to the central plaza, the beauty of the murals in Mexico City, the richness of the culture, the cuisine, all of that. And, you know, to, to a person, they were all just so surprised that there was this culture and tradition and history that they had just never been aware of. We also climbed pyramids down at um, Tenochtitlan. So, you know, we had, um, yeah, we had some extraordinary experiences with them. But through partnerships, which is the other way that we run our global education programs, um, we're connected to a group called Isla Urbana. And this is a young group of Mexican young engineers who have designed a water uh, collection system that is very economical. And in a city like Mexico City, where they anticipate running out of water in 2030, a city of 25 million people. Um, these water collection systems that catch, catch rainwater can cover about 70% of a, of a household's uh, water needs um, through the year. And of course, all these peripheral areas in Mexico City are not connected to the water system. So we have taken these students, um, in this case, teachers, uh, to work on those projects alongside the technicians that are installing them and learn firsthand about the very global uh, concern for water scarcity. And we try to tie these projects, the, the, the projects with certainly good community work, but with the uh, UN Sustainable Development Goals, which of course one of them is water. Another is cultural heritage. I mean, there are a number of these goals that are global that we in make this effort to connect these visiting programs um, to be demonstrations of those uh, sustainable development goals. 
Yeah. So what um, you touched on this a little bit before, but what are some of the sites, the specific sites that um, that VIA uh, uses? And do you see the continuing to use these after the pandemic? Because I know the pandemic has made travel impossible. And so it's maybe changing relationships with partners uh, outside the US. How do you how do you see all this playing out? And, and if you could begin maybe by talking about some of the specific sites a little bit. Yeah, I, I of course, uh, Rigo spoke in some detail about the San Diego site. Um, we also have designed and will hopefully when the travel opens up, um, have a complete experience on the Mexican side in Tijuana, in Tijuana and, and Tecate. And that incorporates some of the things Rigo mentioned, the Kumeyaay community, as well as uh, the work, a lot of it oriented around schools where we're in relationship to the, in running our community development programs. In Mexicali, there's some distinctions. We do some work in the schools, but we also offer um, a connection with a group of beekeepers that are out in the community of uh, La Ladriera. It's a brick making community out um, on the edge of Algodones, Mexico, rural. And it exemplifies all the kind of issues, if you will, of globalization. Um, the, the communities out there maybe make, a family might make 2000 bricks in two weeks and be paid $40 for that. So you get upfront the experience of, you know, these the kind of, and that's not even five miles from the US-Mexico border. So, you know, you get that sense of the difference of, uh, of, of the economics and the um, cultural aspects there. And um, in central Mexico, we have the partnership with Isla Rana, where we do the water projects. Uh, we also, on those trips, generally travel to Guanajuato and also do some work in, in the schools um, out in the, in, which is considered the Bajio or the breadbasket of Mexico. Um, the Guatemala programs are primarily in the highlands. Um, the communities we work in are in the province of Chimaltenango, which is a, a, a province that was very deeply uh, impacted by the civil war in Guatemala. And so the communities there are poor, somewhat divided, and have a real need to enhance their school system. So a lot of the projects there are oriented around the school system, but visitors learn about the war, they learn about the Mayans and, and their culture. Um, the program in Costa Rica is more oriented around sustainable agriculture. And we work with breadfruit growers that um, departing from San Jose out to the coast, visit a bunch of farms and learn about what these families are doing to propagate breadfruit, which is one of the magic, magic foods of the world, I guess. Um, in Sri Lanka, we work with the Sarvadaya organization that has a 60 year history of community development in the rural areas of, of Sri Lanka. And we go and live in a village for a few days and participate there with a project defined by that community. Could be a variety of things, depends on what they, they sort of see to do. Um, on the project there that I visited with Rigo, I think we were in a village where 300 people were building a road and our little group of 13, it really pointed out to you how immaterial our support was. <laughs> but we got to be in a village with 300 people digging a road to get access to their farms. And so, you know, they're all different, um, but we in intend that they would all be connected deeply to the needs of the communities themselves. So as I hear that litany, at least that strikes me, and we've discussed this internally with staff, that here in San Diego, Tijuana, Via is in many respects, uh, you know, much more uh, hands-on and really, with, especially with the partnership with Los Niños, 
really deeply rooted in the community development work itself. And at the other locations, these are partnerships where it's really the, the partners on the ground who, as you just mentioned, are, are setting the agendas and driving the projects. And, um, you know, again, VIA is in that respect uh, responding very, very much in those, especially in those more distant examples, is responding to the direction and leadership of the communities uh, on site. Is that, a, is that a fair summary? Yeah, I think that's exactly the case. And to go back to Jim's question about what do we anticipate happening? Yeah. Um, I'm not sure any of us know, but I actually, from reading things about travel industry and all of that, there's a lot of pent up interest to go places and do things. And I think of course, we'll have to be very cautious about the protocols and what will be new and different for that. I know that some of the people that study such things are saying that travel internationally will likely not open up till 2022. So we'll have another kind of full year of uh, travel maybe some opening up regionally in the US um, in the latter part of 2021. Um, so I guess my hope is that we'll go back to a vibrant program that includes travel. But what we have done in the meantime is maintained, attempted to maintain our partnerships with schools that have been very supportive of the community relationships that we have, uh, particularly with the San Diego program. And um, to that end, we did a pilot virtual program uh, with uh, Villanova this fall, and we have some others lined up for this spring. And if we could, I'd like to uh, invite our partner, Gabriel Reed, who's on the call here somewhere, um, to kind of speak to that because he's um, been with us for a number of years. He's been working this year as more of a consultant in the design of this virtual program. So maybe Gabriel, you could kind of frame that for everybody. Sure. Well, thanks for having me. I'm thrilled to get to continue to work and support VIA's global education. Um, and uh, this is a great conversation, I think, with many important distinctions. And I guess one that I would make um, uh, in my role is working with all kinds of different universities. Uh, many of the coordinators that we've worked with in the past have been tasked with, you know, um, really reinventing their programs because um, the schools still maintain a prerogative to need to do global education. And to their credit, um, you know, uh, many folks have really worked hard um, to put together some experiences for students uh, that bring, like Rigo said, that, that give them a chance to know one another and give them a chance to uh, meet people uh, from specific communities. So we, um, we've been a part of those conversations, fortunately. And um, you know, most of the time these are referred to as virtual programs. And uh, one of the things we took the opportunity to do is to do um, a virtual migration, uh, meaning that we recognize that if students aren't having to fly somewhere, we can drop them in anywhere we want along the border. So one of the things that was neat for us uh, is we had a chance to think about uh, the strengths of our traditional program, our traditional travel program, and then um, how to maybe not necessarily reinvent those, uh, but reposition them for students to try to uh, give them uh, a sense of what the spirit of the border is. And I think that um, from the conversations that we've been a part of with students and their feedback, uh, and this has been a really collaborative process. Um, one of our tasks uh, with VIA has always been how do we stay true to ourselves as a, a truly participatory development process? Meaning that uh, the experience and the needs of uh, and outcomes of the experience uh, are really determined from the community itself. And so we did our very best to start a virtual migration at the community level, but that community level has two registers, the student level and the university and then um, the community partners that we've worked with traditionally and really went into it in an open way to see what might come out of it. Um, and we started by just dropping students off right in the you know, dead center of the colonias in Tijuana. 
Uh, and for us, that was a really different starting point as an experience. And we were then able to bring them across the border. And so that was our initial kind of uh, concept, uh, really incorporating a strong sense of participatory development, getting everybody on the table. Um, and then bringing- can, can, I, can I interrupt for one second? Yeah, please. Yeah, please. yeah, that's sort of no, the framing. Yeah, yeah when, when, when you say drop them off, I mean, just to be clear, you're not driving across the border and leaving them. Can you, how do you do that? What is, what is the mechanism for that? Yeah, yeah, I think, um, I think one of the strengths of our program is that we weren't trying to take what we normally do and simply make it virtual. Um, the recognition is that these Zoom environments, just like we see here today, allow for a different kind of community to take place, different sorts of experiences. Uh, the conversation is different. Um, you know, there are uh, strengths and weaknesses to both of those things. So when we say drop them off, what I mean is, um, you know, many of the students were meeting in person uh, in Philadelphia together, uh, or they were all remotely in their dorms in Philadelphia. But the program itself started, we tried to make it really location based. Um, and we wanted them uh, to know what where Tijuana is, but also to know more about the city, the place, the colonias, the people. Um, and so when we say drop them off um, using different things from Google Earth to, uh, to, to live streaming content from the border, um, giving them, putting them in location in Tijuana, trying to get them in the experience. Um, again, not to approximate what it's like to be there. You can never, you know, the scent, the smell, the food, the people, you know, um, you know, you need a little bit of human BO when you're traveling in order to understand that you're traveling, right? Uh, we don't get that on the computer, but, but what we tried to do is, uh, is put everybody in a conversation where they could be open, um, but they also had a cultural context. And that's why the migration format was really, I think, uh, inventive and, um, and a strength of our program is because we were moving them around the border itself you know, crossing them over the border. Aida made really wonderful videos and doing work through the wall and then in San Diego. So trying to maintain a sense of place, but recognizing that, you know, we're on a computer and your sense of place is still, you know, probably your living room. So in a, in a sense, the students are getting the perspective of a migrant or, I mean, is that, is, or a person that is crossing the border frequently and, and lives in say Tijuana, but needs to come to San Diego on a regular basis? Yeah, uh, I would say definitely not. I mean, I think, um, you know, I think a migrant uh, from, from my work uh, with people on the border has a, to articulate and replicate that sense uh, would mean having real risks and challenges. You know, and one of the things we recognized that we do in our traditional travel program is we're able to put students in safe but um, productively uncomfortable uh, uh, situations, right? That's what travel does, yeah. you know? Yeah. And um, everybody behind their computer is in their comfy chair with their back support and, you know, their thermostat. And so there's a very different reality in terms of um, your own uh, identity and sense of security and sort of recognizing that maybe we couldn't put people outside of their comfort zone, but that maybe by people being in their comfort zone, they might be more open to a different kind of intimate conversation in Zoom. Um, and so that's really what we sort of tried to focus on was, um, was not replicating risks, but really just trying to put people in a situation where um, they could reflect and articulate the way they think about the world uh, in hopes that when they come and visit us, some of these experiences will really um, help open them up uh, quicker and connect them to our community faster. Um, so our hope is that in designing it the way we did, it will be a logical extension of our traditional travel program and that we can use some of these experiences um, either pre or post trip uh, to, to maintain and build community with the students. Yeah. You know, this, this gives me the opportunity to just announce, uh, and you'll hear more about it by email, all of you who are connected, that we really are taking uh, this coming February next month, taking the template and the structure of the program vir via virtual program that Gabriel has just been describing. And we're going to be using that for our February event of border, we're calling it Border Encuentros, 
many of you participated a year ago in the border encuentro, which involved immersion and uh, a bus trip across the border and, and that kind of uh, you know travel, physical travel. This year, we're going to be uh, doing a virtual experience in that regard. I'm going to put the link in the uh, in the chat room so you can go to check it out. You'll get an email from me as well soon with this information. But I'm also just going to quickly share the screen so you can see, and this will underscore uh, what Gabriel was just describing, that across three weeks in February, February 11th, 18th, and 25th, we'll really be uh, dropping uh, participants in to uh, three experiences. Uh, on February 11th, we'll be speaking directly and meeting with promotoras, uh, the women leaders of Tijuana's colonias. On uh, February 18th, we'll be visiting with migrants and deportees who have really taken ownership and are custodians or keepers of Friendship Park. And then on February 25th, uh, the muralists uh, who across decades have been uh, painting change at, at Chicano Park, as the, the saying goes. And just, uh, I, uh, we've just launched this page, but I use the very same image that Gabriel and Aida and the team working on the VIA virtual experience used. And they call that experience the grassroots practice of engaged justice, a virtual migration along the US-Mexico border. So again, uh, you'll hear more in the coming weeks, but just to say that our goal is to let uh, those of you who are friends and supporters of VIA get a little taste or an, a partial experience uh, of, of what the students at universities like Villanova, I think the next one is Merrimack, is that the next one? Yeah. Uh, you know, get a taste of what the students themselves are experiencing through this via virtual uh, program that we've designed. So um, yeah, that- just, uh, just to say a little bit about uh, Jim's question about, well, what do you mean when you say migration? Hmm. Um, we really thought that by having the students experience Tijuana and the work that you know VIA has done down there for 45 years, and then, if you will, go up through the fence, learn about the border fence, learn about the work that John and that team have done for with Friends of Friendship Park for decades now, and then sort of end up at Chicano Park where muralists have designed what is now a heritage site and then also is an expression of local community activist work. And so that migration was intended to be, well, we're gonna start, we're gonna drop them in Google Earth in Tijuana and then have this over a period of various weeks, a travel up to Chicano Park almost as if they were taking that journey themselves. So that's the virtual migration. <laughs> you know, I'm curious back, I wanna at least make sure before we close, uh, Jim, I know you may have a follow up final question or two, but I wanna talk just briefly more about, get a chance to ask you all to talk about the experience of it and maybe uh, about how different people might experience it differently. Andrea Rocha had a question in that regard, wondering about different kinds of students um, I have a million questions, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> ask, ask one of them. Ask one. <laughs> because uh, first thing, and the first question is for Rigo, and then I'm going to jump to Gabriel. Um, I, I can only imagine that students of color, and in particular Mexican-American kids and Chicano kids and kids with a migrant experience already are coming to you with a different narrative, a different conversation about the border. Right. So I, I want you to talk about what the experience of Mexican-American and Chicano kids coming to the border looks like, like, let's say, from Chicago or from other parts of the U.S. And then uh, for Gabriel, I was thinking, um, is this virtual program primarily designed for white kind of middle or upper class kids? And how can we veer away from that design so that it also integrates the uh, experience of kids that are in fact your second generation Chicano kid in the Pilsen neighborhood of, of Chicago, for example, right? So I'm, I'm trying to get at the issue of, of, of the perspective of people of color and young people of color that are coming to the border without that kind of naive sense of border um, to it. Well, I'd like to, I'd like to just say one kind of framing question or one framing comment, and then, you know, turn it over to 
to uh, Gabriel and, and Regal. It is true that the schools that can, if you will, afford our program have often sent students that have no orientation to other cultures. But not only, they also see this as an opportunity for their, uh, if you know, they have clubs and stuff that are oriented around diversity. They have um, different international programs that in, incorporate international students. And I'll just mention one group that I hosted the last, the very last group we hosted that left on March 13th last year that hosted in person uh, was a, a, a collection of the diversity from Penn State. And there were uh, foreign students in that program, students from the Middle East, students from you know other parts of the world. There were, uh, I think, two DACA students in that program. And um, then, ver you know, various others, um, a representative from the Black community, a representative from the transgender community. Um, it was an incredibly diverse group of students. And um, I think that they, and I'll turn it over to Rigo, I do think they have a very different experience than, than um, you know, a group of maybe younger and maybe not as aware of other cultures. Um, that come. My, my comment on this, and thank you for the question, Andrea. I, I, I really love your question. That's, that's so interesting. Mm -hmm. And for me, it's, it's, it's uh, very fulfilling when I do have the opportunity to, to address, like you say, Mexican-American, was a Chicanos. For, 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 for me, it's so important to realize and also to be very aware that within the country, even within our community, we have an identity crisis. An identity crisis in a sense because uh, many of our youth today, they're not even sure where they fall within all the identity that, 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 uh, that they've been exposed to. A lot of times they relate more to, uh, to uh, videos than they do to another human being, in particular another human being from their own cultural background. So for us to have that opportunity to expose them to the reality and, and maybe to reinforce somewhat the identity that perhaps they have lost. So coming to roots, coming to finding their own roots, I think is very, very important. For us here locally as something that, that as VIA, that's part of another component of work that we do as far as community development is primarily trying to expose kids from within our, within our own communities to come and experience the same experience of, of these uh, of wealthier kids come and experience with us. And, and for that, obviously there, there's, there's, uh, there's different venues that we're trying to promote. And also we're trying to get resources for, for us to be able to address that. Because obviously, you know, we still need to pay speakers. We, need, we still need to uh, uh, contribute back to the community in that particular sense. So for us, that's, that's an ongoing project. And, and we do realize and see the importance of it of, of, of uh, introducing our own communities into the work that we do. Whether it be, again, I can't focus enough or stress enough the, the, the point about that we do have an identity crisis. So, so uh, I hope I answer your question. Gabriel, you wanna say a few words? Yeah, um, I think that uh, this topic probably couldn't be more important um, and I mean, look, I'm a, I'm a country kid from, you know, a dirt road here in Missouri. All right. So, and I come from that context. It's, it's a way I see the world, you know? So, and I try to be careful with that, meaning that, um, you know, I've, I've learned that I have to work through that lens, right? and work to the other side of it and open it as wide as I can, but still knowing that that's, that's my place. Like, that's where I come through. It's like when Rigo says he's a, he's a front of ESO, you know, I, I hear that and I think, man, well then, you know, well, what am I like, you know, uh, and, 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 and I think that that, um, I think that our, Elisa's point is really true. Uh, there is a, an economic aspect of this in terms of opportunity, I think that um, the program design itself is 
probably not. I mean, it's um, it's very open, and I think it's not as um, uh, codified in a certain sort of like you know we're going to bring the kids from the East Coast that you know don't know this cultural context and show them this one, and we're going to clarify that. I think um, really to Rigo and and the community's credit. Um, you know, it's something that is uh, the border itself, right, is so diverse and so wild and so unique. You know, it's it's the best of New York, right? You know, I mean, the refugee community alone is one of the most diverse communities in the United States in San Diego County. So there are so many ways to um, to open the experience to all kinds of people. And at the same time, um, you know, many of the coordinators I work with you know, are, um, you know, are not as, it's not as diverse of a field as you would want as a starting point, right? Just as the opportunity to students is not. And when we've had a chance to work with um, very specific parts of universities um, or grants that are funded that help us bring community college students from Miami-Dade to San Diego um, or, uh, or, uh, different groups at Villanova, you know, that are that are much more diverse upon their arrival. What I would say is um, the feedback that we've gotten is that the program has been equally as powerful for them in showing them something different about either their own heritage or the border or the diverse cultural context that that VIA really exists in. And I think that's the one we try to share. Um, but if I'm really honest with myself, you know, it's it's nowhere near diverse enough. Um, you know, in, in opportunity. Um, and I think there's all kinds of ways the, the content, the program itself could continue to reflect that. So, um, I mean, it's an active conversation that we're, we're certainly having, uh, but it's one that, um, it's one that's, uh, that's tough. Like it, I feel it, you know, um, in a palpable way. I don't know if that answers question, but those are just- Can, can, I, can I just Thank admit you. to something just, just for, for, for just people get an idea as far as uh, the work that we do here and, and, and taking, taking from, from Andrea's question, uh, I do, for, for VIA, I do quite a bit of different uh, Chicano Park presentations throughout the year, but it's not just through VIA that I do it. I do it through many other grassroots organizations. I would say that out of, out of all the groups that I do, probably 75% of the presentations that I do are to, for community-based uh, uh, organizations and groups and, 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 and community. The other 25% are the ones that are being channeled through VIA. But that just to give you a sense as far as our, our commitment, I mean, as VIA and, and myself as a, as a Chicano activist of giving back to the community and again, because we know that the resources are limited within our own communities. So we survive thanks to the 25% to the of the people that can't afford it or the institutions that can't afford to come to, 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 to be with us. Thank you very much. Thanks for this wonderful conversation. Thank you, Jim, for guiding us. Yeah, through. thank you. Uh, Gabriel, thanks for joining in. Elisa Rigo, uh, so appreciate your uh, giving us that panorama perspective. And thanks for the great questions. It really, as Gabriel said, this a growing edge, and uh, this cues us up for next week, uh, as we've kind of created, uh, you know, our or structure at Via uh, moving forward. We've talked about community development, global education, and the third branch of work uh, we've called Borderlands Institute, which really has to do with some of the uh, in, the community work, but also the education work done really locally, specifically on the San Diego side of the border, not exclusively, but, and that's, a, that's where we're, we're feeling our way into that. We're trying to discover what does a Borderlands Institute look like? Uh, we know that Chicano Park is a central piece of that, Friendship Park pr probably as well, but you know, what is it that uh, VIA can contribute uniquely to the San Diego Tijuana Borderlands in this vein? That's actually the subject of our conversation next week. So I do hope you'll all join us next Tuesday uh, Rigo is actually, we're gonna, uh, Rigo is gonna lead that conversation. He's gonna interview uh, me and Elisa and uh, Jim. Part of our conversation will be, what is it about the borderlands that you know, causes uh, gringos like us to uh, fall in love with the peoples and place and culture? What is it that causes some of us to 
dedicate you know uh, many years uh, of work to uh, the communities of the borderlands. You know why should gringos care about the borderlands? I guess would be a, a, a shallow way of, of, of framing it. But it's really an exploration of where VIA can make a unique contribution in this space. And so I do hope you'll join us next Tuesday, uh, 12 noon, uh, same process. Uh, if you're watching on Facebook still and, and are not yet receiving invitations and would like to join us here on Zoom, just drop us a line, we'll send you the link. And uh, we'll continue the conversation moving forward using those three frames of reference. Community development, which we discussed last week, global education, uh, I love uh, Rigo's emphasis on the give and take uh, of the experience of encounter, uh, and then uh, the Borderlands Institute piece that we'll unpack next week. Please join us uh, for the Border Encuentros. You'll hear more about it, but that again is a way to taste and uh, get a taste at least of this uh, virtual uh, portion of our global education program. So with that, I think uh, we're all ready to sign off. Uh, thanks to everybody again, Rigo, Elisa, Jim, Gabriel, and thanks to all of you who uh, participated. Uh, we'll hope to see you next week. Gracias por estar con nosotros.